just going to talk about some basic stuff. Uh, we'll take, we're going to build a gym here, but uh, we're just going to work our way through it step by step. And uh, as we, as the tool enters, we'll fix that tool apart and go from there. All right? So you see, when you're out watching the contest, you see a lot of people. When they start that shoe, they, they heat up the center and they take a bump. So why, why are you doing that? The, the idea behind building a shoe is that whatever you start with is what it should be in a finished side. Right? So if it's 5 16 three quarter, when I'm done, I want the entire thing to be 5 16 three quarter again. I don't want something thin down. And so generally, you know that when you make a toe bend, as, as the steel turns, the outside stretches, the inside swells. Right? So just that little stretch on the outside is just enough. If you didn't put anything in there, it's just enough that you're not going to be able to get it back. Now, I could say that uh, to a blind man on a fast horse, that little bit of that thin down doesn't mean diddle. It don't mean nothing. But if you're in a contest, you want this. You want the judge to see your shoe. So you you want things to pop lines and everything so he wanted to he can look at it flip that shoe any which way and it's all five sixteenths that's the reason all right so i put a i put a little toe mark in this and i like to push the toe mark hey roy yeah they're saying they can't hear you can i move your microphone oh that's all good where we need to be. Oh, I wasn't talking loud enough. Hmm. All right, so by putting it close to the edge like that, you can see it. But if I turn it around, you can still see it, right? So when, you, when my steel goes in the fire, I want to be able to just glance in there and know exactly where the outside of that shoe is going to be. And that is where I'm going to grab it to bring it out of the fire so that I am I'm fully prepared right now. If I, if I grab it on the other side and I have to come to the anvil and set it down and turn, I'm just wasting my time. Right? So I want indicators to say, there it is. I can, so I can come out and I'm on the grid. Whether it's going to be a bone or I'm going to turn the toe or whatever, but I can always see it in the fire. All right, the other thing is that through the course of building the shoe, I want to maintain complete control on that shoe at all times. I don't want something getting off, bent too much, bent too little. I don't want to have to go back and fix. So I'm, I'm, I strive to try to keep control all the time. So if I come out for a toe bend and I go here and I hit that, it's almost, I mean it's pretty tough to get your hammer to hit perfectly square on that shoe. And it hits kind of a slight angle. And that, that causes the shoe not just to bend for the toe, but also it bends the other way. So that's a fix. I'm going to have to put it back up here and fix it. And I don't want that to happen. So, I, I like to work in little small gaps that, that moves the steel down to the animal in a gap. Right? So if I, if I put that shoe on the animal and I lift it just a little bit and just drop my hand, that's all I have to do. Lift, drop, lift, drop, lift, drop. And there's always a little gap. Right behind it. But, but I'm keeping this. 
going straight. Straight all the time, right? I can do that on both sides. If necessary. There's a thing that happens always, depending on where the heat is, if the heat is large, and I'm going for this toe bend. If I get here, halfway between my tongs and that spot that I hit right there, it will bend. All by its lonesome. That happens through the course of making that shoe entire. Always happens. So yeah, I can compensate for that. I know I'm gaining something over there, but it's all good. Alright. Now I'm going to come to the horn. I'm going to put that toe line right in the center of the horn. I'm just going to rock the shoe back and push that little gap underneath there. Alright. Turn it around. Do the same thing. If I want more than that, I can take it to 90. Now watch this back branch right here. When that comes down to 90, you can see the gap right under there in the center of the hole. Push it down. And then give it a tap out there. And that's the side. There's the gap. Alright, this is kind of this is kind of perfect. I set this toe up with my center mark at 90 degrees to this edge of the anvil. So you can see the way that this is laid, laying out. You see where that needle is and that needle. I mean, it automatically tells you that you're not balanced, right? That's showing up. You're not balanced on this shoe. So, which, which side? Maybe a little bit here. I want to straighten this now. So I'm going to put it center of the horn, and I'm going to twist. Right there, I have a gap underneath it. Right? All I have to do is get straight down into the center. That's how much it moved it, just that little bit of a little tiny gap. I'm still not quite where I'd like to be. So I'm going to come back and hit this guy. Let's try that. from there to there is almost identical. I know that my toe is symmetrical. Right? When I get that far into it, I want to take a nice overlapping blow and run. Turn that toe. Bring that up. Right back to there. Bring that up 90 degrees. That edge of the handle. Right along. And we'll make this side plain stamped. So I'm, I'm using a tool now. By, by bringing the tool always 
to my hand. I have a rest that I, I don't have to touch that hot stuff with my tool. I can rest it against here and I can line it up. And I'm lining up this edge of the four bunch on that line. So I can see it, mark it. That's that part.
goal is, and I let's put it back in the lineup again, and I put a straight line here from that toe nail that I put on, put a straight line, I should, that line should bisect the center of that heel. Done. So now I know that's a good place to be. It may not exactly fit the foot, but that's a, that's a good place.
have an advantage, a couple of advantages. One is I can knock that handle off and I can take just the, the head of that tool with the driver. Right? The other thing is it has a wooden handle which absorbs the concussion of every hammer point. The steel handle, there's a reason that they come with a plastic handle on it. If you take this off and put a whaling on it, it will sting your hand. There's so much vibration. These are handy, they're cheap kind of thing, but they're an accident waiting to happen. And it's all because of that oil. You have high carbon and low carbon. It's the dissimilar material. If that weld is not put on through a process of pre-heat, well, post-heat, anneal, uh, there's a fair chance that that, uh, that weld is not going to hold up. Also, in the process of the weld, if the weld from this side does not penetrate the weld from the other side, it leaves a hole inside there, which is a chatter hole. So now you have more vibration in the tool. Oh, it's a, it's a tricky little guy. I mean, they work. They work fantastic. But you just have to know their limits. That's all. Right? This, this grinder here is a, a contact wheel. Uh, all my grinding in the shop is um, all done on a wheel, on a contact wheel. I never use the platen, ever. Uh, there's, a, there's a seam, you know, where your belt's joined, there's a seam in there. And what happens on, on a platen? As that seam comes across there, it, it lifts the belt and they end up with a chatter on your tool. Also, by setting gear and pressing onto there in one place, it, it generates too much heat in the tool. That platen. Now they do make some stuff that you can by it's a silicone tank that goes on the, the platen and it will take that shatter out of there, uh, give you a little softer vacuum, but you still develop a lot of heat. Uh, working here, off of the, off the shaft, that's your line right there. And that's where all the work's done. All right, so when I'm, when I'm grinding tools, I, I don't wear, uh, I don't, I'm not touching up my tools, I don't wear any gloves either. I want to be able to feel how much heat's being generated in the tool as I'm cleaning it up. If it gets to the point where my fingers can hardly hold it or whatever, or even close it down, I'll dip it, dip it in water, punch it down. I'm not hot enough to, to bother anything, but I, I just can't hold on to it anymore, right? So, uh, the, the bottom of that tool is going to be looking at me. So, I'm going to lightly touch the wheel, and I'm going to drop down, come to that edge, and then I'm going to put pressure on it and come up in a straight line. And I can keep it quite, quite straight and quite flat, right there, doing that. If you turn it over and you do that, you cannot see where your, the tip of that tool is. And if you come past that center mark, you went into a, a curve, and it just takes and knocks, knocks the tip off. So holding it up that upright, doing it right there, Pressure to apply, come on. Yeah? You use about a, uh, about 80, 80 grit to 100 grit. And when you're, when you're, you kind of keep one belt just for tool, kind of thing. Because you want it to be very sharp, it starts to, the duller the belt, the more heat is generated again, right? 
All right. We'll lay that out again. So it's that line that comes out of that toenail and the bisects there, and I know that's that's the move. If I put another straight edge, there we go. If I put a straight edge in right here, right where the, that shoe meets the straight edge, right there, that's the, that's my corner, right there. And I want I want my nail hole to be just in front of the corner. All right, now we can fill in the gap. Put as many meals as you want, 30 or 40, whatever. Get them all in there. All right, mark. So, the four punch is going to displace material. As soon as the four punch starts to enter, if it's, if it's dead in the center of the stock, I should get equal resistance on both sides. If I'm a little to the out, to the outside, off of center, I'm going to get more movements to the outside. That's where the frog eyes come, right? The, I'm pushing material down and stretches going out. So I come back and I hammer those frog eyes in. I move material again. That's two times I've moved the material. Well, every time you move it, it stretches. So. If I take this four punch and I take it to the finished size on the first pass and then do frog guys, when I come back, the nail hole will be elongated, it will not, it will be larger than what I want. Right? So I can save some of the distortion by only pushing this in about two thirds. And that's just the truth. I mean, it's just the, you got to guess at that kind of thing. It takes a little bit, you keep your eye on that kind of thing. Right? So again, over to my hammer. I'll do one more. It's almost impossible if you put this over underneath your hammer, your tool. It's almost impossible to not get it in the center. You're going to put a four punch over here. I guarantee you to lean it. And if you're standing back trying to look down in there and you go to hit, you, you won't hit center. You're going to hit this corner. That goes for your fuller as well. As soon as you start beating on this one corner and not hit the center of the tool, this is an accident waiting to happen. The tool's going to fail. So whether it's you're out here, and you're pulling, and you're trying to see down in there, you got to get yourself up and on top of it in order to hit center. Not to say you can't do it. It works. But you have to be careful. Oh, now, I've already done all that. I'm going to be solid on the horn. Come back with a four punch. You don't have to do much. Cool. I've done that correctly. And I have I finished out to what I think is exactly the size of that, that end of that nail. I should have about an eighth of an inch of material underneath that hole at the bottom of it. So it's not to say that your print will be in it, pop that. It's just, it's just a little hard on the print So you use, you use the drift. The drift is just a narrow punch. So then it's narrower than your four punch. So that when it when it enters, it doesn't 
doesn't make contact with what you just did with the fork. Okay. Same thing. Over the hammer. Give it a couple of pops. Don't spend a lot of time in the, in the shoe with this, with this tool. Not to say you can't go back over the stuff all the time. This is a little tiny guy. And, and we're still pretty, pretty hot here, right? So it's easy for this tip of this to suck heat out of the shoe. And then it's, now it's getting close to the end. So I'm starting to get resistance back from the end. And then that's where this thing goes south. It gets warm, it, it hits that resistance, and it upsets. Sometimes you can actually stick it in there and you can't get it back out. Keep wailing it up. So it's, it's, not, it's not a speed. I mean, it's just a couple of, couple of licks for a roll, get out. Get out. If you feel it, you want to tip tools off in something. Uh, I think probably the best stuff to, to dip off in. Oh. Best stuff to dip off into is uh, Forstner's hook packing. It has a lot of petroleum in it. Uh, if you're using beeswax, if the tool is hot enough to melt the beeswax, you spent too much time in there already. You want something that you can quench pretty quick in, and then in the portion or change the work. Alright, All right, so I'm almost to a black heat now here. Hey, this little critical guy. So which one shows up the best? That's as close as I can get. That's perfect. Well, you see with that tip. What I what I do with my frittles, I was they have a punch I have a punch press in the shop and uh, I'm looking at the punches that came with that uh, punch press. And that has the advantage, the punch press has the advantage of that has, it has a, a lower dot. But we don't use a lower dot when we're printing. We're going over, hanging over the, the hardy hole or something. But a, a punch, the punches have relief on it. This is exactly the dimension of the needle, but there's relief behind it. So when it goes through, it shears the piece out. There's nothing to hang up. Well, our ritual is direct opposite. It's just a full taper, right? So the further that you drive that into the shoe, the bigger it gets. Well, that's not what you're after either. If what you want is the, that little, probably sixteenth of an inch that's left on the bottom. You want it to be cool enough to be able to shear. You're not pushing something through like it would be if it's too hot, but that thing it needs to snap. That's what that's what these do. They snap. You can and you can hear it. And if you look at the pieces that come out, if you can find the find the official slugs on the floor here from previous deals, and you study the side of it, you can see where it it cuts just a fraction. And then the rest broke. Right? It's like a piece of glass. Make a scratch, two. Same thing. That's what we're trying to do with that little piece of steel in there. So I want to duplicate this. After after I've used the virtual for a while, I'll I'll just go over to the grinder and I'll grind off about half an inch at the end of that. Grind it up, deburr it, and then throw it in the fire, and, and I redraw the, the end. And I'm trying to draw it down so that the tip is smaller 
and it actually falls into that can. Goes through that hole. Right? Then I, I let her settle down and I try to get little tiny beads on the very tip of that pricker. Yeah. And I start I'll, I'll set it and I'll come out just taking my time, keeping it straight, and I just start back to the fire, come back out, tap, 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 back to the fire, just do this until I hold it up to where I got it. I'll back this up and then and it'll come out. I've upset the end and mushroomed it. Then I'll take another little heat and setting that mushrooms on the on the handle, pick my fritchel up just a little bit so I'm making contact. Just lightly tap all four sides. Now, so these these end up going away. So I get a like this. It's a little over exaggerated, but basically that's what's on the tip of that picture. Yeah. Time. When I'm done, it should sit be exactly the same size as all my other tools for that particular name. And when you do that, you touch the, you set the, the corners like that. Uh, there's a, a deal with the ratio, the steel ratio, but what it actually does is it, it, you end up with a little cup at the very tip inside because of the steel moving around. And that's good too. Now I got a cup going through. That's pretty cool. Well, I might as well. Oh, this lesson acts as though I was punching too hot all the time. So it doesn't really shear very well. But if this was a, a piece of steel, I'll bring it over and I'll, and I'll set it. And then I want one good sharp blow. That's all the way I want. You know what I mean? Come on. Okay, there's the slug. Well, this is not shearing because of the softness of the lead, right? It's a uh, and this would be the same, the same thing that would happen in aluminum too, because of the softness of the aluminum. But it work. Sure. That's not bad at all.
Okay, this side we're going to fold. I have a couple of different folders here. This, this one comes over to my hammer. It's about seven eighths of an inch wide, and I'm going to fold this in the street. So my puller can be as wide as it, I want it to be. Mark it. All right. The puller has a, a slight arc on the bottom of it. And then, I don't know how to do this or not. Mike, just look straight into that. Yeah, let's see if I can get it. Wherever you are. Uh, uh, let me back up just a minute. There we go. Okay, so if I rock this up like this, there you go. See that, that arc? matches the arc of the bottom of the fold. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's what you're after. It's tuned up over there. Uh, it's moved out here in front of this. It's done this way. Not this way. On the ground. Not that way on the ground. It's just and we'll try to get it to match exactly. That's what that's important. Don't uh, you don't want an extremely super sharp edge on it. You want, you want a slight radius. And then when I say slight, it's if you have a scotch bright wheel, it's just a pass over that and it knocks the corners down in the spot. That's the size of the radius. Doesn't really do anything. So I was talking about the seven eighths at this way. As long as it's in the straight, I don't have anything to worry about. The set, this seven eighths in this size shoe, uh, if it was turned and then I'm trying to pull it, will have a tendency. If it's too wide and it'll scrape the branch out. So I need to drop the size of the floor. If I if I'm pulling after it's but I draw that to about three quarters. The smaller the shoe gets, the narrower your cord is. If you're building belt buckles, probably only want the cord to be about a half an inch so that it can make the movement and not distort your shoe. Yeah. All right. So now, As the, as the puller enters into the chute, you're getting a certain amount of resistance from the inside you're, because you're starting outside of center and back by your heel and you're coming to center on your toe. So that resistance on the inside will, will cause it as, as the puller to penetrate. into the this straighter up and down will get pushed that way so this will lift like that and oh, the bigger angle on this side is pushing that way and when it does that it takes out this corner here and you end up with this really pulling thing so to try to give myself, just like the toe, give myself uh, material to work with as the pullers, I know it's going to distort it like that. So I, you do what they call hemming, right? Hemming. So I'll tell you a story. Uh, we were at a WCG contest and uh, they have a deal called a match play. And you get, you 
have to eagle-eye this foot. You're allowed to measure the foot. You have to eagle-eye the shape. But you're given little or no time to do things. So the, the shoe that was they were making at the time was a, a three-quarter footer, uh, three-eighths, three-quarter, six nails and a toe lift. So we're in the semifinals. There's only four guys left. And uh, at about four minutes and something, I can't even remember what it was, four, four and a half minutes, at four and a half minutes, the generator ran out of fuel and all the fires got in. The fan went out. So Craig stops everybody, well, let's stop, stop. He says, oh, we'll get some fuel in there. He says, go cut, go cut another piece, we'll just start over. About that time, I was standing in front of uh, Travis Coops and took his shoe and threw it on the ground, came rolling over by us. At four and a half minutes, all Travis needed to do was put a toe clip on there. And I thought, well, I'm really glad that that's in Grand Island. Yes, because apparently I wasn't paying attention the first time. Because how do you do that? How do you do that? Four, four six nails. So when it, when it finally cooled off, we picked it up and I started measuring all over the place. I'm measuring, measuring, measuring. So I'm going to three eighths, three quarters. No matter where I look. Oh, good. I get to watch them again. How the hell did they do that? All right? So I'm just following Travis this way. But I, I can do it easier. Travis did it here. He's better than I am. I, I do it over here. But I'm going to hem this. And all I'm going to do is take this material and push it straight down towards that board. Straight in. There's no angle. None of that. Just straight in. Right? The first glue has to be behind the end of your fold. It needs to be just behind that. This is a little easy spot to clean up later, but if your hammer gets in front of that, you'll never get that divot out of your shoe. So don't go get there. So I'll put it here, use the round side of my, my hammer, push that material in. And I'm going to push it in about an eighth of an inch. I'm going to come here and finish it up. Yeah. So what do we do? Took it from three quarter to five eighths. And then it slowly tapers up where our fuller tapers up. Then it comes back up to three quarter at the end of the fuller. But right here, I'm at five eighths of an inch there. Right? But I'm also thicker here. I'm over three inches, not by much, but about a sixteenth of an inch. Right there. Alright. Now this was hot. Bury this puller. I want to finish this. I haven't finished it. So I drove the puller in back up in here. And I am right back to three quarters of an inch now. But now I'm going to turn the branch. So we know that a lot of things are going to happen. When I turn that branch, the outside is going to stretch, the inside is going to swell. Do I have enough material here for my hemming that I can keep that at three inches when it turns? But now this is really straight. And I have that toe sitting there. If I jam it in here and hit here, I have too much hanging out here. Right, so if I get here, that is coming this way. 
and it's going to curl up wrong way. So when I get ready and just come out and hang, hang the heel over there, just get it out of my way. So now it has resistance when it comes up that way. Now, bury that toe off again. Make sure I can snuggle right in. something wrong with the line it needs to be straightened out a little or something and I can take that puller and pull it back and all I'm doing is cleaning that line clean up the inside look at the outside and lean it away push it still hit the center of the tool and I'm putting my pressure on wherever the, the line is messed up That's what I want. I want this to be crisp and sharp coming right to the floor. Same with the inside. If you don't spend the time to get this, what you're going to end up with that. There'll be a shadow all along the outside edge here. If you didn't, if you didn't put enough on the on the back of this. Uh, Overlapping blows running down there, uh, whatever you don't, you haven't finished it. If that little shadow still appears along there, this line is not crisp and clean. I should, I should gain length just by doing that. So everybody's going to be different as to how much to put into that. You got to keep that in mind in your measurements. If you're going to pull it to shoot, know that it's going to grow that much. Almost a quarter of an inch. You're growing this lid. Alright, so the puller takes the place of the four punch. Same thing, same procedure, drift. Find it.
the truth will be seen more truth here. And especially in steel. That move right there. I really like that. Knocking it off. Instead of beating on the shoe, it is hit the pistol with it up in the air a little bit and the thing falls off because it was resting in that spot we were talking about. Where's Tom? How are you doing on time? You got like 20 minutes. 20 minutes left? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, better get, better get busy. All right, um, that does that, but right now we're going to get real serious. That is, it, you got folks, give me a little time to set this up just a bit. But I think it'll be worth it. I don't know, maybe not. Maybe you won't like it at all. You guys, help me turn this out. Employment office. And uh, where is that booger? Hey. Yeah. Uh, so Sven goes in and, and he leaves in the office and says, So what did, what did you do for a living? And he says, Look, I'm, I'm the guy that sews the elastic. Elastic into the lady's underwear. So she looks it up in the book and she said, Okay, you get $275 a week. I thought, okay, he goes out. Oh, it was in the middle. And uh, comes back out and says, What you get? He said, $350. He says, How the hell do you get $350? So he goes storming back in there and the how come you give me 350 and me only 250? She says, well, he said that he was a diesel fitter. And I looked up diesel fitter and it says, 
350 dollars. Jesus did it. Look, he said, I saw the elastic into the lady's panties. He takes them, puts them on his head, and says, yeah, these are better. <laughs> Still is. Thank <laughs> you. 